Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Isn't this a gorgeous morning out? A little cool, just a little bit on top, but it's going to be a hot day. <clears throat> However, could be worse. Has been. How are the trees in your gardens? <laughs> So glad to see all of you here today in this church, St. John's United Gathering in St. Paul's Presbyterian at the gift of the people and the leadership of St. Paul's. Good to see you. And for those whom I can't see who are watching this through YouTube, Welcome to in sing along, laugh, frown, wonder, just the way the rest of us are doing it here. Good. Now, announcements. In the back of the bulletin this morning, first, today is fellowship time for St. John's United people back at the church downstairs. So when we finish the service here, we go across the street, have a coffee, tea, munch. And also, Petra McElroy's books will be offered for sale at fellowship at a cost of $25 per book, which is the fundraiser for St. John's United Church. Have a look. I think you'd be delighted. Also, this coming Saturday, April the 22nd, St. Paul's Presbyterian is having a spaghetti dinner and silent auction. Five o'clock, 6.30 p.m., two sittings. Keep that in your mind. Send an email, fundraising at stpaulskempville.ca. Should be fun. Also, the North Grenville Choir, Concert Choir, is proudly presenting Golden Age of Broadway next month, May 12th, 13th, and 14th. Here in Kempville on the 14th, 12th to Winchester and Merrickville on the 13th, all in Anglican churches. Tickets, Brood Awakenings, and on a eventbrite.ca site. Lots of things happening, many of them to help others. Call to worship. Easter is God's reminder to us that death and disaster are not the final words, that out of the blackest despair the promise of new hope can arrive, like the fragile, tentative stirring of the butterfly finding new life after the binding sleep of the cocoon. God calls us to believe in that possibility, to search for that new life, and to give ourselves to it without reservation. Let's sing together. Morning has broken, like the first morning.
Would you join me in the prayer of approach? Let us pray together. God of great surprises and unbounded joy, your voice echoes in our hearts into our uncertainties and wanderings. Help us to breathe deeply, to take good heart, and to not be afraid as we recognize that resurrection found the disciples and finds us. Amen. Time to wonder. Good morning to everyone here and to everyone at home. Have you ever thought you knew what was going to happen and then something entirely different happened? Maybe you were going to watch television and then found yourself lighting candles because the power had gone out. And if you're lucky, maybe you got out a board game or cards and had a maybe more fun time than you might have had watching TV. Or maybe you kids were playing on monkey bars, if that's what they're called nowadays, they probably have a new name, and fell off, and instead of playing in the playground, you found yourself sitting in emergency waiting to see a doctor. Today's gospel story is full of lots of surprises. People thought they knew what was going to happen, and then something entirely different happened. 2,000 years later, we aren't surprised anymore because we know the story. Last Sunday, when Helen McGregor came running in here all out of breath and excited, it really helped. In fact, I found I had a lump in my throat because she brought the story alive as to how completely amazing it was that Jesus was alive. Today, be open to surprises. Be open to the moments this day when something good happens that un is unexpected. Take time to notice it appreciate it, and be thankful. As you listen to the gospel, notice the unexpected things that happen and imagine how the people in the story felt before and after the surprise. The Surprise Visitor, based on the Gospel of John, chapter 20. On the morning of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. She was surprised to find the stone rolled away from the entrance and the tomb empty. She reported this wonder to the other followers of Jesus. Later that day in the evening, the disciples were gathered in a house behind locked doors. They were afraid that the religious leaders would come after them now that Jesus had been killed. Suddenly, Jesus was standing in the middle of the room, yet the doors had not been unlocked. Peace be with you, said Jesus. Then Jesus showed them the scars on his hands and feet from the crucifixion. The disciples were overjoyed to see Jesus. They blinked their eyes to make sure Jesus was really there. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As God sent me, so I send you. As the disciples stood there, hardly able to believe what they were seeing, Jesus breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus said to them. It will help you follow in my way and do my work. Now when this happened, Thomas, who was also called the twin, and who was one of the twelve, was not with them. When he returned, they told him what had happened. In a jumble of excited voices, they announced, we've seen Jesus. Thomas wasn't sure what had happened. Their stories simply did not make sense. Unless I see the scars on his hands and feet for myself, I will not believe, said Thomas. One week went by. The disciples who had seen Jesus were still excited. Thomas still couldn't believe what they were telling him. 
Then again, when the doors were shut and locked, Jesus appeared before them, and Jesus said, Peace be with you. Turning to Thomas, Jesus said, Look at my hands. Put your finger in this scar. Don't doubt what you have heard. Believe. Stunned, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Jesus looked at Thomas, perhaps with a smile, and said, You believe because he saw me. Imagine the joy of those who have not seen me and still believe. After that day, Jesus appeared many times to the disciples, but they are all not written down here. These are written down so that you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah and have life in his name. Thus ends the reading of the gospel. So I asked you to watch for the surprises. What surprise happened for Mary? The tomb was empty. And think how she must have felt. Initially, she went expecting to help, anoint his body, body was gone. That must have been frightening, sad, confusing. But then when she was led to understand that he was alive, amazement and joy. How about the apostles? What surprise happened for them? The appearance of Jesus in the room. They were locked in there afraid, afraid they might get captured and killed. And then suddenly there was Jesus with them. So from starting out being very frightened, the, the gospel tells us they were overjoyed, amazed. And then for Thomas, he had not been there. He missed the big event of seeing Jesus alive. Imagine how lonely he must have felt. Everybody else was all happy, excited, and he was in a different space. He was back in Good Friday space. And then what happened for him? He saw and believed. And Jesus even invited him to touch. They don't, it doesn't say whether or not he did. What, seeing Jesus, it seemed like maybe was, was enough. There's so much that we could say about this story. What I want to make sure is that for you kids and for the kid in each one of us, that we know that it's okay if, like Thomas, we're not sure what we believe. We sometimes call Thomas Doubting Thomas as if that's a bad thing. But I think a better name for him would be maybe Confused Thomas, Questioning, Searching Thomas. Much more positive words, because searching is a positive thing, even though when you're going through it, sometimes it may not feel that way. When I was 14, I was very confused about faith. I was questioning, wondering whether or not there is a God. And it really bothered me, because in my family, I knew faith meant a great deal to my parents, so it must be something worthwhile. But it really, I was very confused, but I was also very shy. So unlike Thomas, I didn't say anything. I kept it to myself, and I let it work at me. And I searched, actually, for a number of years. But eventually, I did ask other people what they thought and talk to other people about my, my concerns and fears and confusion. And sometimes people gave me some good suggestions as to what I could do with my questions. And in my searching, I finally became very clear that for me, there is God, and God is very real and very important. Thomas did something much wiser. When he couldn't believe the news that his friends shared with him, he came right out and said, I won't believe unless I see for myself. And in a way, that's what each of us does in our own journey of faith. We have to find faith for ourselves within the community. And so when Jesus came, he didn't scold Thomas for not believing. Jesus loved Thomas just as he was with his questions. And he took him where he was with his questions and gave him what he needed. 
And God does the same for us. So if we have questions about faith, or about anything, think of that as an invitation to growth. If we look at our questions with honesty, God will help us and lead us to grow. Our answers may not come instantly, but if we keep praying and searching, good answers will come. And like in today's gospel, the answers may surprise us. Sometimes God works with us through the help of other people. Sometimes God helps us find our answers directly, somehow on our own. Not really on our own, with help from God. Sometimes, whatever it is, it's whatever we need. It's all Easter growing in our spirits. And now, let's listen to the anthem, He Lives. This reading is from Acts 2, uh, verses 14, followed by 22 to 32. Peter addresses the crowd. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. 
this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with him with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witness. I remember some very many years ago when I was confirmed in the Church of England, as it was called then, Anglican later. Confirmed, meaning accepted. And it was a, a grace filled moment. move ahead years and some years and I was, my name was up for being ordained in the United Church ministry. And my mom, who was not an overly religious person, said, you know, Paul, when you were confirmed, you told me someday I'll be a minister. I had never remembered that. But she had, and then shared it back. I always thought of that sometime around Easter, the gift of the moment. So when you look at the readings that Mary and Rick and Vic did together, I think it's very daring of the early church to introduce the story of Thomas and his so-called doubt on the very first Sunday of Easter. It's three times daring because it is the gospel reading for this Sunday every year, years A, B, and C. Why do I feel it's daring well, first, it raises the question of doubt in the context of our celebration of the Bible's ultimate miracle. And second, it exposes the tolerance of the early Christian community because Thomas, the so-called doubter, was there among them, not hiding his doubt, but displaying it, arguing with the convinced, and they didn't throw him out. On the contrary, he was still with them a week after the first experiences of Jesus. Friendship, family, connectivity. And later, Christian generations have not been so tolerant. Christian history is littered with minimum requirements. You must believe at least this 
or you must believe at least that. Sound familiar? <laughs> if you remember the Nicene Creed, I suspect it was inserted into much of the wider church's liturgy, not so much to affirm the faith of those present as to discourage the attendance of those who disagreed with some aspect of its formal belief, its orthodoxy, if you like. If you look at the Nicene Creed written by the church fathers around 350 AD, you'll see a listing of the details of what the church at that time believed about God, Father, God, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit together. There's very little which gives direction for our lives other than knowing the tenets of faith, but knowledge is not in itself faith. Faith leads us further. Where are we to go as followers of Jesus? The Apostles' Creed, created sometime in the fifth century by the Western Church, and then the United Church New Creed, established in 1968, are both shorter creeds than the Nicene. The Apostles' Creed looks back at the scripture and invites the reader to name all aspects of Christ's movement through Holy Week and the theology lying behind the days. The United Church's new creed invites the reader to agree in broad strokes with the story of Jesus the Christ and then to take it further. Why are we called to be the church? And how are we to live out that calling? Take the time to read the new creed. Well, you win in a few moments. We always use it every Sunday. Our new creed culminates in the following. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. I hold that in me completely all the time. So as you look at these three creeds, I ask you this. What do you really mean by faith? What do you mean by faith? Let's go back to the locked room with Jesus, the apostles, this time including Thomas. If filming count cameras were invented at the time and a camera person was there, what would the camera have recorded? Well, it's a valid question. Some might say that the camera would have recorded a group of people looking very worried and then the arrival of a man with wound marks on his hands from the crucifixion and the change in the expression on the faces of the gathered friends. Others might feel that the camera would not pick up any figure of Jesus as he was different now. Perhaps what the camera would record is the change in the phases and behavior of the apostles from cowering and sad to amazed and overjoyed. The change that happened within the apostles is huge. We cannot understand with our minds what change happened though in Jesus himself we can experience with our hearts the change that happened to the apostles from frightened leaderless followers of Christ they were transformed into brave confident preachers and teachers Peter for instance stood in the city square proclaiming the story of Jesus Thomas who had not believed, became a missionary, bringing the Christian message to India. Did you know that? Luke, a follower who came a bit later, is believed to have brought the faith to Spain. And that is still there today. Because today, pilgrims still walk 
the Camino. Jesus had come alive and so had his followers. So what do we really mean by faith? The other disciples didn't seem to have required much of Thomas except that he give serious attention to their experience. How much should we require of someone today who says they want to be Christian? Indeed, how much or how little should I require of myself? I can only say that I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ with all the implications that has for constant turning upside down of ordinary and accepted values. I can only say that death is not driven our Lord into the past, but faith is openness, however tentative, to the transforming power of what Jesus taught in his words, in his life, in his death and resurrection. Now the words faith and doubt are not opposites. We think they are sometimes, right? No, they're not. They are complementary. They are companions, if you like. The opposite of faith is not doubt, but cynicism. Just think of it that way. And subsequent despair. The opposite of doubt is not faith, but credulity, a willingness, a reckless need to believe the unbelievable. Faith needs the sharp and refining quality of questions which are raised because of doubt. Doubt needs the surprise of mystery and the shock of grace. Different thinking, isn't it? The reflection on the Christian story and the faith evokes may produce doctrine, but doctrine itself is not faith. Faith is a lifestyle, however inadequately adopted. It is what the early Christians called a way, a way of life defined by a story and a person. Because it is a way, it is open to all kinds of people who might, in the light of traditional Christian discipline, think themselves disqualified. For Thomas, the quintessential sensate man, he listens, responds to his five senses. He was not so much a doubter, really, but a very hurt man who knew of Jesus' death a man who had missed the first Easter appearance. Thomas said, show me. And when Jesus did, it was he who saw and responded with, my Lord and my God. You saw a lot of that in the pictures on the screen a few moments ago. Wonderful. But Jesus tries again and again. No, we can miss our Lord because we have been doing some of the thousands of ordinary things we have to do in life. But Jesus tries again and again. It's easy to forget that. It's easy to think of ourselves as searching for our Lord, quite forgetting that centuries of Christian spirituality assures us that our Lord searches for us, for you and me, with that resulting yes for us also. I want to remind you that in our own lives we can feel deflated, somewhat less than because Thomas was there and we were not there. But my friends, we, you and I, can touch lives with our Lord, which our Lord has touched. We can touch lives deeply wounded by pain or suffering for whom Jesus is Lord in an extraordinarily inspiring way. We can touch lives almost destroyed by addiction 
for whom our Lord has been the means of recovery and resurrection. Churches of a variety of backgrounds have spent time reaching out to people with those issues. Maybe we could be doing some of that in the new, near future. If we can do that, then what's our response to be? We might consider bowing our heads and saying, my Lord and my God. But how do we take that further? So, where are you in this moment? Where is your faith at this moment? On what or whom is it focused? I would hope it's focused on our Lord Jesus Christ and on your ways and means of sharing that faith with others. Maybe, maybe not verbally, as many of us are somewhat shy about that, but nonetheless sharing our deep-seated conviction of Christ's presence in our lives and doing it through our love, our care, our compassion for others and for the world around us. That living is much more than the words we often say. Now, where is love? Where is care? Where is compassion in our individual lives? Think about this. I leave you this question. And as you think about it, the Holy Spirit will show you the way. Amen. And so we ask God to breathe in us, on us, as Jesus did to his closest friends in that upper room. Breathe on me, breath of God, the hymn. Would you join me with the affirmation of faith? Our creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit, 
We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to do justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Now, sisters and brothers, we have no good apart from God. Therefore, let us keep God at the forefront of our minds and give generously from all that we have been given from the fullness of God. Every day is a day of thanksgiving. Would you join me in the prayer? Gracious God, we cannot see all that comes of these gifts, and so we entrust them into your hands for the sake of your service here in Kempville, elsewhere in Canada, and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us continue in prayer. God, we praise you for all the wonderful things in our lives, for good friends and good health, for good food and clean water, for safe places to live and to work, for the beauty of your creation that inspires artists to create beautiful and thought-provoking works. For all the gifts you have given us that make the world a wonderful and joyous and engaging place to live. Yet God, amidst the joy in life, there are still places of sorrow. And so we pray for those suffering from mental or physical illnesses May they know your healing, and we pray for their caregivers. May they feel supported by your presence. We pray today for your earth. May we find new sustainable ways to care for the earth and all creation. We pay, pray for people impacted by natural and man-made disasters. May they know your comfort. We pray for those suffering from political violence and unrest. May they know your peace. And God, we pray for your people wherever they are gathered Help us to learn from each other 
so we may come to know you more deeply and be guided by your love. And we pray together in the words which our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so, my friends, in a moment or two, let's go make a difference. Our final hymn. <laughs> My friends, let us go forth knowing that we are blessed with God's presence in our going out as we were blessed in our coming in. Let us live our lives making decisions, carrying out our actions in the knowledge of Jesus' presence with us and May our living be filled with the joy and the power of his Holy Spirit today, tomorrow, and always. 
Amen.